everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on the Hope for Today broadcast. I'm your host, Doran Wengard, founder of Wengard Ministries, where we are delivering hope to every heart. I'm continuing on today with the series, Hope in the Spirit. I'll be doing Hope in the Spirit, then Hope in the Soul, and Hope in the Body. Each of those will be a series. I know hope in the body is where we live, it's where we want answers, but it all begins in the Spirit. When the power in the Spirit gives hope in the soul through belief, that allows the soul to turn to the Spirit, and that brings transforming power through the soul into the body, which that that brings the hope that we're looking for. That's where healing happens. That's where the power of the Spirit comes all the way through, but it begins, first of all, in the Spirit. So stick with me. Learn each step. Go for revelation. Ask the Lord for wisdom. I want to talk today about something that can very easily be overlooked, or at least misunderstood, as people learn about becoming born again. I've titled the message today, The Truth About Dying. Now, I know that I've talked before about the fact that we are given the righteousness of Jesus when we accept the free gift of salvation. This all happens when we believe the message of Jesus by faith. But what exactly happens at that point? And what is our responsibility from that moment on? What does it mean to truly be born again? This is not really as complicated as it may seem at times, but there are things that we need to understand in order to go deeper. All people are born in sin from the moment they enter the world. This is not because of something that any of us did to deserve, but simply as a result of what happened when Adam and Eve fell at the beginning of time. So I'd like to go to Genesis 2, verses 8 and 9, and just read God's instructions to Adam and Eve. Verse 8, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we see here that every tree growing was there, but there were two trees specifically mentioned. They're special, and they're significant. They're the tree of life and the tree of knowledge, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want to skip down verses 15 through 17. I encourage you to go and read the whole story, but in verse 15 it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Notice here that God only had one rule for Adam. He said you can eat of every tree in the garden. You can enjoy the fruit of it. But you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was this one simple rule that tested the heart of mankind to see if he indeed would love God completely and obey everything that he had said. Now, if we go to chapter 3, we can see what happened. So, I want to read Genesis 3, verses 1 through 7. See what happens. Now the serpent was more cunning than any, any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. Hmm. Now, I want you to remember back to what God said would happen in Genesis 2.17. He said, In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what happened when they ate? Did they die? 
Or did God lie about what would happen? It sure seems like they kept living because they didn't just fall over dead. So what did happen? I want to describe to you the literal meaning of what God said in this verse. God said literally, in the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. The original Hebrew has a double use of the word die, which describes a double death that would happen. And this is, I think, really what gets missed so easily as we just read through and we hear people talk about it. Understand, truly understand what happened there. The first first death is a spiritual death, which... It's still the same effect of sin that we experience today. It's not that your spirit ceases to exist, but rather that it is separated from God. The second death is a physical one that happens as a result of the spiritual separation from God. Do you see what's happening? Dying, you shall die. The second death begins with the aging process that it's a natural result of being born in sin. I believe that Jesus came to redeem our bodies, and even aging should have less and less power over us. The more we spend time in him, the more we we understand and, and, and learn from him. But we'll talk about that later. When their spirits experienced separation from God, they immediately became fearful, and they hid themselves from each other and from God. This is the same tendency that we have when we find ourselves in sin of any kind. Now, I want to look again at Genesis 3-7. Now, if you're reading, go ahead and, and look at that verse. Notice the first word. The word is then. That shows us that immediately when they ate of the fruit, something very significant happened. So look at that verse again. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew they were naked. Hmm. The word then is our clue that the moment the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil went down their throats, their spirits literally disconnected from God, and their bodies began the aging process. So, dying spiritually, they shall die physically. So, the spiritual death or separation from God immediately began the dying process physically. James 2.26 actually describes this same thing. He says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James is basically saying that it's a matter of common knowledge, but I'm not sure it's as commonly understood as it was now, you know, now as it was then. But he's basically saying when your spirit leaves your body, your body will die physically. This is why the redemption from Jesus absolutely must be accepted while we are alive. If we die physically in a state of spiritual separation from God, we are lost forever. Do you understand that? We get one chance. This is why the redemption from Jesus must be accepted while we are alive. I'm going to say it again. If we die physically in a state of spiritual separation from God, we're lost forever. That's our choice. This is the decision that we have to make. However, if we die physically, but our spirits have been born again into a spiritual connection once more with God, we go immediately into Him and into His presence. Now, I don't say, however, that death should be viewed as our Savior. Death was never never God's plan, and it's still not His plan. And we all remember John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly, the words of Jesus. God can never, uh, he can never give us anything but life because he is life. Every connection with God will cause us to live. There's several other verses that I'm sure you've heard or read before, but I've almost always heard them used in context with dying physically. I'm sure that these verses do apply to to dying physically, but look closely as we read. I, I want you to notice that Paul talks about mortality being swallowed up by life, not by death. 
There's another meaning here that we've been missing. But it is. It is what Paul is describing. So I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verses 4 through 8. 2 Corinthians 5 here. All right. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, we know the truth about death. We no longer fear it. This is the beauty of it. Because the physical death has no, no, more, no longer has any power over us. So, why do we have to be dead to be in the presence of the Lord? Paul actually had this happen multiple times while he was alive. His spirit would literally leave his body and he would be caught up into the presence of the Lord. I don't think we should make this the only meaning, but we should not limit our understanding from this happening. So what does it mean in Genesis 3-7 where it said the eyes of both of them were opened? What eyes is this referring to? I believe we have two completely separate sets of eyes that we can see with. The eyes that were opened when they sinned were the physical eyes of their bodies. Up to this point, they saw everything through the eyes of their spirits. This means that they could see all things spiritual and physical together. When their physical eyes were opened, they could no longer connect to the spirit world. This is why they didn't know that they were naked up to this point. The view that they had of each other was of the purity and perfection in the Spirit. Look how Paul describes our spiritual eyes. Actually, you can look it up. Ephesians 1.18, it's a common verse. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He calls them the eyes of your understanding because we literally have spiritual eyes. And they bring understanding when we are able to see clearly with them. The beginning of this happens during times of dreams and visions and times with the Lord, when you begin to see things in your heart. And I have some stories I can tell you about, but I want you to ask the Lord for that. Ask him for the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened. Ask him for your spiritual eyes to be opened again. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 and 17, it's common. Again, we, we know these verses. Paul says, We regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So the sin of Adam separates every human from God. But everyone still has a deep desire to be reconnected to God. This is the message that God has given us to take to the world. Be reconciled to God and be born again spiritually. Have the eyes of your heart and understanding opened to see as you were created to see and take that message of reconnecting with God to the lost and the physically dying people around you. This is the great exchange. Jesus took what we deserved and died in our place so that we could get what he deserved and live forever connected with God from this moment throughout all of eternity. Now that is good news. Thanks for listening, and God bless you. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. (laughs) 